You've tuned in to Unpause Your Life with Dr. Kelly Estes. Your access to success strategies and more to help you move onward and upward with your life. Listen in each week as she interviews others who have really taken their essence to the next level and truly unpaused their life. Now here's your host, Dr. Kelly Estes. Hey everyone, welcome to the show. This is Dr. Kelly Estes and I am founder of the Addictions Academy the addictions coach and rehab rescue. Welcome to Unpause Your Life. This is a great podcast where we showcase people who have done something extraordinary with their life. I welcome you and I hope you enjoy all of our guests. On my way found a reason to wake up another day. Before we get started, let's hear this short message from one of my supporters. Did you know 81% of Americans would like to become a published author? Chances are you might be one of them. What's stopping you? Writing and publishing a book takes a lot of work and is expensive, right? Well, not anymore. For your next book project, or even your first, team up with Hassle-Free Books. They make it so easy to become an author. They remove all of the fuss and struggle and make it smooth and simple. And it's far more affordable than you could ever imagine. Go to hasslefreebooks.com and use promo code UNPAUSE to receive a 10% discount off of any book project. Get started right away and become a published author in as little as 45 days. For your free one-hour book formula guide, which will show you just how painless it can be to become an author, head to hasslefreebooks.com today. All right. Thanks again for joining me. Let's get started with today's show. Took a walk down the dark road where they said that I shouldn't go. You are listening to Unpause Your Life with Dr. Callie Estes, the addictions coach in the Addictions Academy. My next guest is Billy Lee. And Billy Lee is a transgender woman, activist, and blogger currently living in Los Angeles. I'm so jealous. Born and raised in Indiana. <laughs> Billy graduated from a broadcasting academy in Illinois, where she secured her degree in radio, TV, and film. Knowing that she was ready for bigger things, Billy moved to California, where she began her journey as a stylist, working with many, both in and outside of the entertainment industry. After finding success as a stylist, Billy wanted to move on and create a place where people could find peace in their daily lives among the hectic city. She soon opened an organic cafe, which she owned and operated for two years before she sold it in order to move forward with her dream. Billy has since focused on motivating and inspiring others as a lifestyle blogger and TV host. After Tinder introduced their new transgender feature, Billy has been a spokesperson and model for their movement. Currently, she is on the board of Trans Life LA, a nonprofit which helps bring health and wellness to the trans community in the area. You may also recognize Billy from her recent feature in BuzzFeed videos. She continues to work with BuzzFeed and others in the trans community to create videos that aim to educate on trans issues. Watch Billy Lee on the hit reality show Vanderpump Rules on Bravo TV Mondays at 9 p.m. Eastern. Welcome, Billy. Hi, thank you for having me. <laughs> How are you today? I'm really good. Yeah, today was a wonderful day. Thank awesome. you. All right, so let's open with this. Tell me how you got on Vanderpump Rules. My sister loves that show. She's addicted to it. I know. So many people are addicted. Um, I knew someone who knew Lisa, and I was looking for a job because as an activist, you know, we don't really make money to pay the bills. So I needed a gig. And, yeah, my friend was like, oh, I know Lisa. She loves the LGBT community. I don't even think she has anyone trans working for her. This could be a great opportunity. So I was like, okay, let's do it. So I met with Lisa and we kind of instantly fell in love and she's just an amazing woman. And now I'm working on Sir and I'm on the show. So now Sir is the restaurant, correct? Yeah, Sir is the restaurant where we film at. She also owns Pump and then Villa Blanca. Sometimes we film at Pump if we're like, 
having a, an event or something there, but it's about us working and we real life work as sir. Okay. Now you're, if correct me if I'm wrong, but you're the first trans person on Bravo TV, right? I, I guess, I don't know. I, I recently had someone come up to me and be like, oh, you're like the trans woman of Bravo. And I was like, oh, there's no one trans on Bravo. And they're like, no. So I guess. That's yeah, true. that's pretty big. That's huge. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> You're like, OK, <laughs> congratulations. I, mean, I just I didn't even I didn't even really realize that I really know. So I'm like, oh, OK, that's dope. Awesome. <laughs> Let's start here. Can you educate the public on what trans means? Because I think a lot of people understand gay and they understand lesbian. But beyond that, people start to get confused and they don't really know a lot of terminology and sometimes they get confused and say, I don't know what to say because I don't want to say the wrong thing. So let's start there. Well, I mean, the thing is, it's, it's not about sexuality. It's about gender. So it is separate. And, you know, if people feel like they don't identify with the gender that they were born with, then that means that they are trans. And also, you know, they're non-binary. So if someone doesn't feel like that they identify with male or female, and they're kind of in the middle. And, and, I, and I love that too, because, you know, there are gays where I feel more masculine energy. We all, as humans, have masculine and feminine energy. And there are gays where I don't want to be all pretty and feminine. I want to be more masculine. And even sometimes whenever I sit on the couch, like, at the end of the day, my legs are all spread open. Like, it's a very masculine pose, but it's like, I'm embracing that masculine energy because I feel comfortable in that moment. And for me, it's all about feeling comfortable. And if someone doesn't feel comfortable identifying as a male or as a female, then that makes them non-binary. And for me personally, I felt like I've always was a woman. I felt like I had so much feminine energy that was just overflowing. And that's really what I wanted to embrace. And I wanted to introduce people with that energy. And so that was like, okay, I need to become a female and I need to alter some things to really be able to embrace the energy that I have. And for a long time, I really pushed it away. And I was told I couldn't be attracted to feminine things. And I was very ashamed of my feminine energy. And when I got to a point later in life and I fell in love with myself, I was like, no, it's time to embrace that. And that's when I decided to transition. But yeah, if people sometimes are afraid. I'm a very open book. I love when people come up and ask me questions. Not every trans person wants to be asked. And it's definitely not a good thing to ask about the genitals, you know, like, oh, did you get surgery? Do you have a penis? Do you have a vagina? Um, it's really about, for me, being trans. It's like, what energy do you want to express? And if you see someone who you might think is visibly trans, but obviously they have a lot of feminine characters or features or if they're wearing a dress and they're obviously trying to look like a female they're embracing their feminine energy and for me I would automatically use the pronouns she and her if I saw that That's and I wouldn't just focus on the masculine energy the person still carries and call them him or he. That's interesting you say that so I had no idea that one of my makeup artists was trans because she presented as female consistently. And when she told me this, she said, I, because I was asking her and I had her on my show and I said, what are some of the things you face? And she said, well, I was at work and someone walked up to me because she never changed her driver's license and she never changed her name. And they walked up and said, well, I hear you have a penis. And I said, that's so inappropriate. Like just walk up to somebody randomly and go, excuse me, do you have a penis? I'm like, why, why do that? Yeah. And if someone said that to me, I mean, I would have choice words for you pretty quickly. And uh, right. I think our society doesn't understand culture appropriateness and we don't understand the yeah. delicacy of some of the situations. I mean, I present as masculine sometimes because I don't like makeup. I don't like dresses. I need to hang around you to get the feminine side. And <laughs> I'm in workout clothes 99 percent of the time. God forbid you get me in heels. So, yeah. I just think our society needs to accept every individual the way they are and the way they present. So do, yeah, people, totally. do people actually ask you that on a, on a regular basis? Like, tell me about your surgeries and, and tell me, do they really ask that? Well, I think the thing is, 
they are curious. People are curious. And I like people who are curious and I accept even ignorance because it's my point to educate them. But definitely not approaching someone and asking about their genitals is appropriate. It's so inappropriate. And I really do think that it's beyond that. It's for me, it's definitely energy. And I wish society, and I agree with you, would be more accepting to how people feel if they want to embrace their feminine or masculine energy. And it shouldn't matter what you, you know, were assigned to at birth, gender or sex. So I definitely am open to it all the time because of my platform with questions. And people, you know, even when I started at Sir, a lot of their questions were like, oh, like, do you have a vagina? And I'm like, yeah, actually, you know, and I talk about my vagina even on one of the episodes, because for me, I went through the journey, and this is my personal journey, that I really wanted to have a vagina. And I went through a lot of pain and suffering for that to happen. And I even had some shame with my vagina. And then I fell in love with my vagina. And now I'm at a point in my life where like, I'm very proud of my vagina and I will <laughs> talk about it. But not every trans person is like that and not and that's not for every trans experience. And it's definitely known in the community that it's not something that people necessarily want to focus on is our genitals, you know. And I agree with that. I definitely don't think it should be a subject. But I do know that society is curious and a lot of people do ask me that. So I definitely for myself, my personal experience, I talk about it. So let me ask you this. What was it like with your family and your friends when you decided this is what I want to do? This is how I'm going to do it. How did they react to you? Were they supportive? Were they not supportive? Did they turn their backs? What did they do? You know, at the beginning, they just didn't understand. They dropped out of high school and they had me when they were 17. And they just didn't have the education and the resources to really diagnose me. And so all they knew was their boy was too feminine. People were making fun of him. People were confused. I had a very like light voice and I had, I was just very feminine. I was mistaken as a, my mom's daughter a lot. And she would get upset and be like, that's my son, not my daughter. And you know, I felt the shame. I felt the shame of my town and the people and my family that was hard for me because I had to hide the fact that I was attracted to feminine things. When it came to my birthday or holidays, I couldn't really ask for what I really wanted. And it just was really hard. And then when I got older and I moved out and I became Billy Lee, they're like my biggest fans. They're so supportive. They love what I'm doing and they're just really proud. And it's like, they see me as their daughter and they've seen me as their daughter for like the last 10 years. So it's pretty cool. That's excellent. That's excellent. Mm-hmm. And that's tough because they expected something else, you know, and, they, and society tells them you're a boy. So you wear boy clothes and you do boy things. And that's what you're supposed mm-hmm. to do. When we buck society and say, well, that's not how I feel. We usually get a lot of pushback. And then eventually people finally say, OK, fine. You know, this is what you want to do. We'll support you. Or they end up turning their back completely and saying, we're not going to do anything with you because, you know, you're an embarrassment. So it's awesome that they support right. you. Yeah, because, you know, a lot a lot of teens, a lot of kids, trans kids and teens get rejected from their family and they have nowhere to go, which is why the suicide rate is like so high. I think it's like 41% of trans people have attempted suicide. If you're rejected from your family, it's really awful. And I just wanted to put this out there also, like, that we have last year, I think in December, the trans lifeline started. And it's really amazing. You, if you have questions or if you're feeling scared or if you feel rejected from your family and you just need someone to talk to, they have a trans lifeline and the number is 877-565-8860. And, you know, you can ask questions and get help. And you also can visit my website. It's mebillylee.com or my Instagram because I'm always available. But it's one of those things where kids are rejected every day for being trans and society still rejects people. The trans unemployment is three times higher than the general population. So, you know, we need jobs, we need opportunities. And sometimes we even need a home because we are forced out of our home because we're not accepted. So it's definitely, you know, my experience is lighter than other people. And even though it's 2018, people are still struggling and trans people are still not accepted and are still not getting job offers. 
We're going to put all that data up there for everyone, that 1-800 number and your website so people can reach out if they need something. I was watching YouTube and there was a 10-year-old on there and he was a little boy who came out and said, I want to be a little girl. And he was talking about it. And he said, I'm the most hated transgendered child in the world. Oh. And he was reading the stuff that, that adults, adults posted against this child. And I was thinking to myself, if this person oh. makes it past the age of 15, God help him, because some of the stuff was horrific. The one woman said, mm -hmm. God hates you. you. You should just kill yourself right now. And I'm thinking, what adult, what person could say that to another human being? Have you experienced any of that? Have you experienced any hate mail or any nastiness? Yeah. I mean, first of all, my heart's broken for that kid. And I and maybe when we end this, we can, you can connect me to that video or send it to me because I would love to connect with that person. I was afraid to go to the restroom as a child because all the writing on the wall was about me. Every rumor was about me. And they would say the meanest things. Yeah, I was I was bullied to a point where I, I well they diagnosed me with childhood depression and OCD. I missed two and a half years of grade school because I was so afraid to go to school, and I lived in fear. I lived most of my childhood in fear. People wouldn't look at me in the eye. I had a lot of girlfriends, but I didn't have a lot of boyfriends because they were afraid to be my friend. You know, it was just really difficult. I mean, some of the worst times for me was going to the bathroom and having to deal with boys beating me up and also writing really negative things on the wall. And, you know, I have to say, it's like some of us get to a point where we really do think about suicide because it's so awful. And I always kept on thinking, and I've been like this since I was little, like, what can I do to get out of this situation? What can I do to feel better? And I still to this day write positive things with a marker on my bathroom wall and I write that I am love and that I am light and that I will succeed and I will conquer my fears and you know I write positive things down all the time because those dark scary things that were written all over the wall were so powerful as a child and I thought well if I can make something really positive for myself maybe that will be powerful and it really transforms my life. So it's like, I think whenever these kids are going through something like this, it's like we have to bring out our life tools, our spiritual tools, and like, what can we do to make this kid feel better and help that kid? And also just loving kids unconditional. It's like, it's so shocking to me that people would be so abusive and so negative towards a child. It's Crazy. that, and I think it's like a lack of understanding and then a presence of fear. What's the big deal if the child presents as male or female? What's the problem? You know, it's still your child. Well, and people, people are scared what they don't know. And that's like, it's our opportunity to teach them and educate them. Like, I love speaking. I love going to universities and different places and doing speaking engagements because it's, I get to educate people and I love answering questions. I can spend hours answering people's questions because they walk out of that room and they tell someone else and they're going to be they're going to respect the next trans person that they meet. And these people who are making these bad comments, they're living in fear and they have no idea. And a lot of people are like, oh, I don't want trans people using my bathroom because my kids could get molested. There's no cases. There, no one's trying to molest any child. They're just wanting to go to the bathroom where they're not getting beat up and bullied. And that's what happens with a trans kid. We literally get attacked and bullied in the restroom when we have to use the restroom that identifies with the gender that we were born with, not necessarily what we identify with and how we feel. And that's just not, just not right. Well, and this is going to sound a little comical, but I'm kind of glad you guys are spearheading the movement because the women's restroom line is three times the size of the men's. And I go into the men's because I'm tired of waiting in line. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't care if you have a penis or not. I have to pee, move over. So it's kind of like, it should be more accepted on both sides. It should be okay. And for some reason, society has identified that trans means pedophilia or trans means rape or something like that. And I don't understand yeah, why. Yeah, and I know why. Because I went to, I went to the Carolinas, I, I believe it was North Carolina, and I protested against HB2 when that came out. And that was just a bill against trans rights and the bathroom bill. And 
I protested. And when I went, uh, I was on the side of love and on the side of like the trans rights. And there was just such beautiful energy. And then I was like, I'm going to, I had a camera crew and I was like, I'm going to go and interview some people from the other side where all the Republicans were. And I went over there and it was like a brainwashing ceremony. They had free hot dogs free American flags. They had country singers on the stage. And in between each country singer, they had someone come on and tell the the crowd over and over and over that your kids are going to be murdered and molested by trans people. There was no facts. Every person I interviewed, every person I asked, there was not one fact, not one person who broke the law, not one person who was accused of it. They literally gave free hot dogs, free flags, free drinks, and free music and in between all that free stuff they just kept on non-stop saying you got to be careful we got to protect our kids trans people are trying to molest our children and i just i saw a scam right in front of me i literally saw a scam and unfortunately that scam has reached the white house so but that's where we are that's that's just where we are right now and that's who we have in office and you know people who aren't educated people who don't have the resources but are told over and over something, even if it's a lie, they're going to believe it. And that's the reason why we have Trump in office. Don't get me started on that. I, I always talk about I narcissistic, know, I know. <laughs> narcissistic assholes. And I'm like, oh, you know, you know, those in power. And people are like, oh, my God, you're not supposed to say that. It's not politically correct. I'm like, ugh. Yeah, I mean, I was just on KTLA and I was talking about it, like the person in the office. I don't like to mention his name, but if, you know, people ask all the time, like, how do you feel? Because someone in the office is fighting against you and trying to take all your rights away. They're literally trying to erase trans people from the book. And my thing is he can try all he wants, but every time he keeps on trying, we just push back harder and with love and love always conquers hate and ignorance. And I'm just like, keep on doing it because literally every single time we fight back and I have so much faith in the trans community. We have so much power because of everything we've gone through. Every movement has power because of the things that they've gone through. And I really do believe in my community and I believe that we're going to conquer. And, you know, it's just all about being visible and educating people. And I'm so honored to be doing this podcast with you because we get to have this conversation and hopefully we can educate some people. That's my goal because it's so tough out there to navigate what's going on and what's the truth and what is fiction. And to your point about killing your kids and raping your children, I I study serial killers and I don't think there's been a trans serial killer from what I understand. They're, you know, heterosexual men and maybe one or two women that are your rapists and your serial killers. So as a society, we have this warped sense of what's reality and what's perception. And sometimes Mm -hmm. we believe what we're told with that investigation. And I think it's so important to have you on because you really are spearheading the movement over there and saying, you know, this is what I'm doing and it's okay. And call me if you have questions and find me if, you know, if you want to know what it's like and then answering questions, you know, people stop you and yeah. and you answer. And that's so different. You're, you went from hiding to being in the forefront going, I'm okay to be out here and talk about this stuff. And it's okay if you don't like me, I'm still going to be me and you're still going to be you. And we're still going to go about our business. And that's so awesome. Yeah. So I'm honored to have you on and I appreciate it. Yeah, no, of course. And for me, it's all about, you know, I went through a journey of loving myself and I didn't have the resources and opportunities. And I really was ashamed of who I was. And then I was like, I can't live like this anymore. I need to love myself unconditionally. And I went on this whole spiritual journey to love my trans experience. And I used to be so ashamed of that little boy if someone found out that I was a boy or and I remember I just did a ceremony where I laid out all these photos of me as a boy and I lit candles and I prayed and cried over this little boy because he went through so much bullying and so much torture to become who I am today you know we all have childhood situations we all have our own thing and it's like honoring that person honoring that child and how far they've taken you to who you are today and I love talking about this. And I love talking about my trans experience because I've fallen in love with it. And I'm, I'm very grateful that I got to experience both genders in one lifetime on this beautiful planet. To me, it's epic. <laughs> <laughs> that is that you've done something most people will never do in their lifetime. So that's, that's right. fantastic. Now, how did you conquer the emotional piece? How, what, what made you finally say, I'm comfortable being me the way I am 
and where I'm going. How did you get there? Because that's what I think a lot of people get stuck and they say, okay, I'm stuck because I not only have to go through the physical side of this to show the world, but I also have the mental side. I have the emotional side to break through. I was very focused on the physical side because I just wanted to fit in. I just wanted to be accepted. I just wanted to get a job. I also wanted to feel pretty. I wanted, I wanted guys to be attracted to me. I wanted to be in a relationship. So many things. And society is very about, you know, your physical form. And whenever I did do the transition and I had all the surgeries, I still realized that I was living in fear. I still wouldn't connect with guys. I wouldn't look at them in their eye. I still had this huge wall built up from when I was a child to protect myself. And I was like having all these surgeries and just, you know, everyone was like, don't you just feel so much better? Doesn't everything just click now? And I was like, no, actually, because mentally I'm still this fucked up kid and I'm still scared to death to connect with a dude. So I had to go pretty deep. And that's when I started doing yoga. I started meditating and I started reading spiritual books. And the first book that changed my life was A Return to Love by Marianne Williamson. Oh, yeah. And oh, my God. Yeah. Who doesn't love that? And I I just realized, wow, my whole life I was living in fear. Yeah. And the only way that I'm really going to live in love is if I really work on my thoughts and really change my perception every day, every thought from fear to love. And it really changed my life because I realized how much I was thinking in fear all the time. And I was attracting it. I was attracting people who were scared of me because I was scared of everyone. And so I went through that and I just kept on reading more books. And I found myself in my local bookstore all the time. And then I went to my local spiritual shop. Yeah, I just, I dove right in because after my mission of transforming physically was complete, I was like, what's next? And I had this dream of being this beautiful woman on the inside and outside. Like I wanted to walk in a room and lift the energy and not just do it with my looks. I wanted to feel it. And that took a lot of self work and, and the whole journey to self love, which I do blog about on my website. And that's magical. You know, everyone has their own experiences where they don't necessarily love themselves or they had experiences as a childhood where we build the wall to protect ourselves. But that wall eventually ends up holding us back from connecting with other humans, from getting the job opportunities that we deserve. So for me, it was really just setting back in the seat of my soul, which Michael A. Singer talks about in Untethered Soul. And it's one of my other favorite books and just releasing the ego and releasing the fear and living in love. That's awesome. Now you've now achieved even something greater than most women will ever achieve, which is loving yourself. Women that were born women that, you know, born yeah. feminine and don't still don't love themselves. So that's, yeah, I, that's mean, and I don't want to like be a gold golden standard at all, because at the same time, I still have my issues. I if a guy doesn't necessarily like want to be with me, like my ex-boyfriend is like three years off and on. He says it just isn't something for me and there's things about my trans experience that bothers him I instantly go back to that fear mode and where I feel shame and I'm afraid and I don't love myself as much and I want to eat really bad food and cry all day like we definitely have those experiences because we are having a human experience and we're in the society no matter how much you work on loving yourself something's always going to hit you the wrong way and something's going to really hurt you and I was talking to one of my trans sisters the other day and it's like, I fell in love with my trans experience. Like I felt like no one could touch me. And then I have this guy who I felt was the love of my life tell me that he didn't want to be with me because I couldn't have my own kids. And because the, some of my trans things about me bothered him and everything about the love of my trans experience kind of went out the window and I was just left crying on my kitchen floor and I was like, why me again? Why did God, why did I have to be forced in this male body when I feel like all this feminine energy? You know, I felt like I was back to square one. And it really just took me a week or two to really get through it and to meditate and to cry through yoga. I cry through yoga all the time because for me, it's about purging and getting rid of those things that are negative. So I'm not holding on to it. And so I can continue the journey of self-love. So it's an everyday process for sure. And, you know, if you make it an intention, like my intention is to love myself. My intention is to love my trans experience. And you'll be surprised how fast 
that develops and how you feel great. But we always do have these things that will knock us off. And, you know, life is one big wave. And sometimes you have to ride the wave when it's rocky and when it's scary. And if you get through that and you hold on and ground yourself, then you usually come out on top. That's interesting. He had such an, a strong reaction to you. And that's all about him. That had nothing to do with you. I know, but we, we internalize it's so it. easy for us. To, oh, yeah, for mm-hmm. sure. We make it all about us. And you know, the four agreements, one of them is don't take things personal. That's so hard. It's so hard not to take things personal, especially when you love them so much. Yeah, that's tough. So let yeah. me ask you this. Did, did you hire a coach or anybody that had been through this experience to kind of guide you as a mentor of what to expect and how to handle the ups and downs? Or did you just kind of plow through it and just say, I'm going to figure this out? Yeah, I just plowed through it. I had mostly cis people, like cis friends. I didn't have any trans friends who were around me when I transitioned. I had one trans sister at the time, and her and I were just kind of like, we want to live our life as a woman. Because when you're born in the wrong body or you're born trans, you don't necessarily grow up and be like, I want to be trans. You just want to grow up and be the person you feel like you are inside. And so I just wanted to be a female. I wanted to be a woman. And so when I did the whole transition, my best friend and I at the time, we did it together. We even went to Thailand and had our surgeries together. And it was like, that was my support, but we did not want to really connect with anyone else trans. We were afraid because we were afraid to like, be trans. We just wanted to be a woman. And that was just the whole part of me. That was pre before I fell in love with my trans experience. It was just part of, you know, being ashamed of who you are. And we both had that in common. We would just wanted to fit in because we were bullied so much. Yeah. And that's, it's really tough. It's, it's interesting how you, you at least had one person that went through it with you. So you had some support. I hear a lot of people that say I had no support and I just kind of tried to do my own thing and didn't know where to turn. It's like, who's going to accept me? Who's not going to accept me? And then the family wasn't there. That's really tough because then it's like, you're out there Mm -hmm. on, you know, on an Island by yourself trying to figure this all out and navigate it. Now I am curious about one thing. What was it like Mm -hmm. the first time? Cause you heard me say, I I go into the mail bathroom all the time because it's a shorter line. I don't care. What was it like the Mm -hmm. first time you went into a women's bathroom? Did you feel out of place or was it at home? Did anybody say anything? How did that go for you? It's interesting because I think as soon as I started the hormones and I like had long hair, I always wore makeup. I was always very feminine. I mean, like very feminine. So when I decided to start hormones is when I would go to the women's restroom and I felt complete relief. Like I felt like I'm not going to be attacked. I felt safe. It was like a security blanket instantly because, you know, the feminine energy is obviously more gentle than the masculine energy. And to be uh, having to go to a masculine bathroom, a men's restroom where the masculine energy is around you and they look at you like, who are you? What are you? What are you doing? You know, it was very awkward. It was very scary. So it was very liberating when I finally got to go to a woman's restroom Yeah, it was a beautiful time in my life. That's awesome. (laughs) Very grateful. That's awesome. Okay, well, thank you for coming on the show. And I I appreciate you taking the time today to to, to give us some of the insight. And if you could please give us your website again and your handle so people can find you. And when your show is on, that'd be great. Yeah, it's um, it's me, BillyLee.com. It's I-T-S-M-E, Billy, B-I-L-L-I-E, L-E-E. Dot com. You can also find me at BillyLee.com. And then my Instagram and Twitter and Facebook is at It's Me Billy Lee. And my show is Vanderpump Rules on Bravo Mondays at 9 p.m. Awesome. Well, thank you again for coming yeah. on. And you're listening to Unpause Your Life with Dr. Kelly Estes. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Thanks again for listening. I really hope you enjoyed the show today. Head on over to iTunes and Apple Podcasts and leave a comment or review of what you think. Or contact us at 1-800-706-0318. If you want to be on our show, feel free to email or call. And if you have a topic, feel free to email or call as well.
Thanks for listening to Unpause Your Life. For show notes and more, head on over to unpauseyourlife.com. Big shout out to recoveryinnovators.com for help producing this show. Thank you, guys. I took a walk down the long road The weather said that I shouldn't go On my way found a reason To wake up another day But they needed to show you All the things that you won't do Find faith or religion But nothing to show for it No need to Down the dark road Where they said that I shouldn't go I knew the dangers of flying Now I'm so far from 